The points were back. Week two was fun. That's what we're going to talk about today on Stealing Bananas. I bet Gretch. Find Stealing Signals at bengretch.substack.com. With me, as always, is Sean Siegel. You can find all of his great work over at Rotoviz. And we're going to break down what we saw on Sunday, do these little Sunday night recaps. This year, we talked last week. We don't know if we're going to do them every single week, but we're doing them uh, so far in weeks one and two. And we're back in week two. And Sean, week two was an exciting week. We had points. We had offenses scoring in bunches. We don't have to be nihilists this week. Everything is good and happy in fantasy football land. The overs were hitting. It's, uh, I mean, obviously we, we want we want scoring for fantasy football. It's much better when uh, when there's points on the board. It is. Um, ben, this was, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say my favorite week because there was a real mix, right? Both the guys that we have and the guys that we don't have were going off in big ways. And so when we do the full, you know, week two, uh, kind of recap and, and look at how everything happened, then, you know, we may be on the losing end of some of the plays. And yet this was the best week of football that I can remember since the pandemic. I do think there was one really good week last season. I don't remember which week that was, but I know that Colum and I had a celebration week where everything did go properly, but big picture. This was the best week that we've had in a long time and on so many different fronts. We had the wide receivers who struggled in week one bounce back. I did a panic, don't panic thing, explained how there actually had been a pretty decent number of receivers who were held to five points or fewer in week one this century and actually went over 250 in 17 weeks, not the 18 weeks that we have now obviously including the buy there. And the three main guys that I was looking at, I was saying it's a great situation for T Higgins, even though he gets the zero, he comes back, has a monster week, probably not a great situation for Christian Kirk or Drake London, but they both bounced back in a big way as well. And it was really interesting to see after Kirk wasn't involved at all last week that, I mean, he was the opposite focal point for the Jaguars, arguably to their detriment. And yet, bounce back. And that's what you would kind of expect to see, I guess, from someone who was so good last year and has the contract that he has. Week one was a little surprising there. And then Drake London looked great. Desmond Ritter had a bunch of bad throws in the game today, but also I think gave you some reason for hope. And some of the things that we talked about that he could do from a fantasy perspective were very much in evidence where they used him to get key third downs you know, he does throw the ball more. He was able to get the ball to Drake London at key moments. Then if, if there was a frustrating thing to that game, there were a couple drives in the first half where they looked like they were trying really hard to get the ball to Kyle Pitts, but that was to no avail. But otherwise, they, I mean, they played pretty well in that game. The, the Packers are probably not a good team. I think the main thing that we've learned from the Packers through two weeks is that their coaching staff can get the guys open and that when you play the Chicago Bears... <laughs> are probably going to look pretty good on offense, but that was a fun game. And yet some of those things are the true undercards to games we saw later. And for me, probably the two most exciting games this weekend were 49ers Rams and, you know, probably not as exciting for a lot of people, but certainly for us, an important one commanders versus the Denver Broncos. Sam Howell was extraordinary. And it, this was especially cool because this game started out with some real issues there. They get down 21 to three. They're not blocking the Denver pass rush at all. He's taking sacks. They look to be in big trouble. One of the other fun things that happens in this game, Ben, one of our favorite prospects, Marvin Mims, gets deep for two 
massive plays. Unfortunately, that was more or less his entire game, but goes over. Yeah, I saw he only ran like eight routes or something like that, or maybe not I mean, even that. When you many. go two for 119, why run more than eight routes as your team is getting yeah. absolutely steamrolled? But then we get in this stretch where, I mean, the Commanders at one point I believe outscored the Denver Broncos 32 to three, 32 to three, 32 to six, somewhere in there, and. Ben, I haven't seen all the games from today. So you just recapped I mean, all the ones that you have seen. <laughs> there, I mean, there could be some contenders. But the Sam Howell touchdown throw to Terry McLaurin is Fantastic. a perfect pass. You'll never see a better pass than that. And it would be my nominee for pass of the year. I mean, just such a perfectly thrown ball. And then Terry McLaurin doing what he's always said that he could do, which is that if you have a quarterback like Sam Hell, he can make that play. His body control, his hands going after the ball, his control through the ground. And this is one of the most beautiful football plays on both sides that you will ever see. Yeah, it was fantastic. I, I had a note on that. First signal is kind of giving credit to both sides. Really nice ball between coverage, really nice play on the ball from McLaurin, like you said. I was just kidding with you because you could tell Sean's jazz when he gets started and he covers like four different games in the, for in the opening. Um, you mentioned the uh, the Kyle Pitts segment. I just wanted to mention that real quick. He drew a defensive pass inter uh, interference on an end zone target and then got an end zone target on the very next play. Or at least I had that in my notes. I can't remember exactly how that looked, but um, I did, I did, I do recall as you're saying that he had several, uh, opportunities. It just didn't really pan out. And if people are, you know, kind of just box score hunting and seeing that John Smith had, I think six targets to, to Kyle puts five, it's not really the way that it went. John, Us I mean, it, it is one of those things where I, I know this gets annoying, but they, they're essentially playing different roles. John o. Smith is like running some like sits in the middle of the zone, like the middle of the defense like a five or eight yard turnaround stop tight end route. You don't see Pitts run that route very frequently. You do see these like end zone shots where he's drawing DPIs. He's on the outside running deep routes. It's, it is more or less a very different element to the passing game. So anyone tells you, you know, Kyle Pitts isn't even getting the tight end targets. I don't know that I would really put a ton of weight into that based on how they're used. And I mean, this is both a good and bad point. But they more or less gave up their first score to try and get Kyle Pitts a touchdown, which completely eviscerates this narrative that they were trying to spin last week, that it doesn't matter if Drake London and, or Kyle Pitts are involved in the offense. I mean, they came out today and tried to get both of these guys going and show that they can be threats. And it worked for Drake London. It didn't work for Kyle Pitts. Obviously, that part is the bad part. But you have to be encouraged that they let Desmond to throw. You have to be encouraged that he made some good throws along with two or three egregiously bad throws. And just yep. in general, that they have so much talent. You can kind of see that start to go. And then, I, I mean, we've been talking about Brees Hall as one of the potential greatest running backs of all time. I don't think I've ever seen anything like Bijan Robinson. I mean, <laughs> that dude, I mean, we know that you're not supposed to draft running backs. I mean, some people think in the entire first round, in the top 10 picks, whatever. But for me, it always goes back to draft the guy who has his position gapped by the largest margin and land as many true superstars as you can, take as few risks as you can. And B. John Robinson in the first 10 picks, I think is absolutely defensible when you look at what he's capable of doing on a football field. And it wasn't just as a runner. I mean, he's involved in the passing game, not like just like Christian McCaffrey, but he's involved in a way that is very meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's not, they don't throw enough for him to be involved like Christian McCaffrey, but he makes plays in the passing game. You, you mentioned that gap, the position. I, I like that because I think it is um, consistent with some of our running back conversations because it's just a lot harder to gap. The running back position, there's a lot of really talented running backs, but he looks like somebody who, yeah, I mean, I'm right there with you. He looks incredibly special. Rushes 19 times for 124 yards, six and a half yards per carry in this game. Also had four catches on five targets for 48 yards. Another really strong receiving game. He had the, the receiving touchdown in week one. 
his receiving role has been really huge. They do split up the rushes more uh, again. Tyler Algier has 16 carries. Desmond Ritter has 10 carries. They have 45 carries as a team in this game. You mentioned they threw a lot early, and they did. And yet, despite being behind, they you know they kind of came back by running the ball a ton. Desmond Ritter, I know at halftime, was already pushing like 20 pass attempts and they were trailing, he ends up with 32, which is still a strong number when you look at like Atlanta's pass volume last year in a lot of their games. Anytime they can get to 30, you like that's a step up. We have to feel comfortable with that. But they, you know, this is a game where they ran uh 78 plays and they get uh they hold Green Bay to 47 plays. It's just one of those games where the plays get very lopsided. There is and some yet, potential for this to happen in Atlanta's favor going forward. Certainly not like this every week, but that is yeah. one of the things that they're hoping will happen. And you look at the the rush attempts, one of the ways that they get to 45 is because Ritter has 10. And some of those are designed and some of those are on scrambles. But when he goes 39 yards and scores a touchdown, uh, this game to me was very exciting because it validates some of the elements that we talked about during the off season where I mean, I was certainly telling people there are going to be situations. It doesn't make sense in every league. It doesn't make sense in every draft, but there are going to be situations where in the last round does make Ritter is a really good pick after week one. You're looking at that and thinking, <laughs> well, that's about as far off on any kind of advice as you can possibly be. I, this is what I was expecting and not to say we're going to get this every week either, but I mean, you can, play this and this is the type of score that in the right context is, is helpful to you and it was predicated at least in part on the fact that he actually used his legs a little bit he's a fantastic athlete yes he is that that's a very specific point that you made multiple times this offseason that he's going to run more than people understand and and yes yeah, some of those were scrambles but some of them were designed as well and they used him interestingly uh down and close as well so yeah very interesting game i I totally agree with you they're gonna try to tilt the the play volume their way with these long drives and when they get into the running game um and they threw with intent in the first half was sort of the point that you would you would take from what i was just saying about how ritter only i think he definitely threw fewer passes in the second half in the first half i don't know that for sure but certainly uh i think from a percentage I think they were throwing more than running in the first half, and they just ran a ton in the second half, if I'm not mistaken. I think they had a lot more play volume in the second half. This is just sort of me guessing based on having watched the game. But anyway, um, I'm with you that, yeah, like this is what they're trying to do, and we might have more of these types of games at the same time. At least a minor, you know, I'm, uh, it's just like 45 rush attempts again, Sean. I mean, come on. <laughs> If I, we don't have a lot of Drake London and I was receiving trade offers of, you know, Drake London for Jackson Smith and Jigba this week and just sort of auto declining those, even though I understand where both sides are coming from. I certainly, anybody who still has Drake London higher than JSN, you know, I feel like that's perfectly justifiable. I do not. And I wouldn't change that at all after this week. Uh, but it is just such a huge relief because Drake London is a very good player. And I, I just think it's, it's not good for fantasy. It's not good for reality. It's not good for football fans when really good players are buried because of their offensive situation. I mean, this, this was wonderful. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a positive to get to see some of that. I, I mean, as, as I'm describing all their rushing and they, they come from behind, they score 13 points in the fourth quarter. They win by one. It is a little bit tilting. That he I mean, you can look at it and say they are going to decide that what they did in the first half when they threw the ball out was a huge mistake. So it was a mistake. Right? Don't get too excited based on this yeah. one game. Anyway, we've spent too much time with the Falcons. There's way too many fun things to talk about to talk about the Falcons. Uh, you mentioned a lot of the receivers that bounced back to Higgins, several others. I bet um, people who have... Uh, Tyler Lockett, we're thinking the same thing. He gets the the overtime winner. Um, people who have C.D. Lamb, after he only gets four targets in the opener, decent game, gets 77 yards on the four targets, but 13 targets, 11 catches, 143 yards in a second game. It looks a lot more like what you were hoping for from C.D. Lamb. C.D. Lamb, and then, Sean, you like mentioned he's ready to 
to join. I mean, the elite. Yes. Just it, it, one of the things that was cool about this week too, I think is that almost everybody has to be pretty excited about their first round pick, except for the managers who kind of drafted their key drafts, maybe at just the wrong time and have a Cooper cup or a Travis Kelsey. I mean, the Kelsey thing will probably still be fine. The, the receivers for the chiefs are still not doing anything. Kelsey, not a huge game today. Does score a touchdown. Didn't look like himself at all yet. He will soon. But, I mean, Ben, this this Seahawks-Lions game, I mean, your Seahawks... I mean, they, it was a fun game. They avoided what could have been a, a huge seasonal hole for them. Geno Smith and Jerry Goff both look fantastic. I think that you could probably put some of that on the two defenses. But when Geno throws over 40 times and averages eight yards per attempt, scores a couple touchdowns, only takes one sack. When Jared Goff throws 35 times over nine yards per attempt, throws the three touchdowns. I mean, both of these guys did what we were kind of hoping that they would do in week one. They were disappointing that week. They look great today. Gino with the trio of weapons. Goff, I mean, somehow is getting big production. Mostly the trio of weapons, except for except for all three of his touchdowns go to the, the other guys. <laughs> Khalif Raymond scores on a flea flicker. You get the two TDs of Josh Reynolds. He mostly got his uh, – Jameer Gibbs leads the team in targets. Very exciting to see because he, he didn't get as involved in the, in the pass game in week one as we would have hoped. Leads the team in receptions with seven. Not a ton of receiving yards, but it was nice to see him – get into that you know high reception role that we were expecting out of him as the number 12 pick Amon Ross St. Brown seven targets second on the team six catches 102 yards but yeah it was funny to see the three touchdowns go to Josh Reynolds and Khalif Raymond well and you didn't even really mention Sam Laporta who looked Laporta right absolutely fantastic I'm I I mean you want to be careful about getting too high or low on the people that you've been promoting and also to high or low and think that you've won or that you're going to get buried by people you were off on. I mean, one of the interesting notes this week is that after, you know, such a great game in week one, I mean, Calvin Ridley was absolutely owned by Legereus Sneed today. It's kind of crazy because right now it looks like the chiefs may struggle on offense, but may have an elite defense, which once they get their offense going, it assuming they do at any point, will make them, you know, even scarier. But then this is kind of what I was expecting for at least the first, say, four to five weeks of the season from Seattle. Because I don't think that there's going to be enough overall volume from Metcalf and Lockett. You look at Metcalf, who had a very nice game, did leave for a little bit with a little bit of a rib deal, only gets the six targets, but goes six for 75. You have Lockett with the 10 targets, 859 and two. I mean, Tyler Lockett, very, very good. You have JSN catch five of his six targets. Unfortunately, the one that is not complete was an end zone target where he does come open instantly off the snap, but there just really wasn't time for Gino to get it to him, or at least he's going to have to loft it a little bit more because he throws it in line where the defender knocks it down, even though, JSN has the defender gap there. The defender was not close to him when he batted the ball down. So when you look at it like that, and then, I mean, anybody who still has Noah Fant, he had four targets, <laughs> goes for 56 yards. I just think, I mean, Fant is so athletic and such a good receiving tight end, so much yards after the catch opportunity as well. I mean, this offense here, Kenneth, Kenneth Walker kind of gets swallowed up and does a lot of but he looked good and forth but i mean he's just he's so dynamic he gets the two touchdowns i mean that one's a little bit tricky you know you do have charbonnet playing in some key moments late but if you are a walker drafter the two touchdowns are very exciting I mean, this was a great football game yeah i thought walker looked really good actually i mean i his stats aren't great and you're right he does a little bit of dancing he is a little bit boom bust at times but he had a really nice early run the touchdowns were – were. I mean, he just looks explosive. He looks like somebody I think that you have to feel like is a hit right now. There's probably not a lot of actionable ways to work on that because he does have the two touchdowns. Walker drafters are probably content with his scoring so far. Not really a buy low necessarily, but I mean, maybe a buy high, frankly, because I thought he looked really good. I, I agree with you on the Laporta thing too. This was a 
certainly a fun game. But where I was going to go uh, as well is you mentioned the Niners Rams game being a really fun one. And Debo Samuel, another receiver that had the tough week one and comes back with a really fun week two. The Niners only wind up throwing 25 passes in this game. They only run 54 plays. The Rams end up running 78. Matthew Stafford throws 55 passes, more than double the number of passes of Brock Purdy. But Debo is the only other player other than McCaffrey and Brock Purdy who gets a carry in this game. He gets five rushes, does a lot out of the backfield. If you have Elijah Mitchell, you're probably not thrilled to see this, that essentially their answer to, oh, we have four really great players, and Brandon Ayuk is breaking out as a downfield receiver. And their answer to that is, we're just going to use Debo as our other running back, which they, they've obviously done before, but they kind of had shied away from. But it makes sense now when you talk about there's only one ball and there's not enough opportunity for all these electric 49ers players to touch the ball, that they're like, we're not going to mess around with any other running backs. We're going to let McCaffrey and Debo be our rushers, and that's all that it's going to be. And it makes some sense. And Debo goes for 7.6 yards per carry and rushes for a TD. And McCaffrey has the long touchdown run as well. They both make an impact in the passing game. McCaffrey not so much this week. Ayuk took a, a big shot early in the game and seemed to be hurting for most of the game. But Debo winds up leading the team in receiving as well. Has a really strong game all the way around over 100 total yards. The rushing touchdown, six catches. And then on the Rams side, I mean, Sean, the, the big surprising names from week one, they were just the whole offense again. I mean, you have, other than the main three surprising names, you have basically nothing. You have Van Jefferson going four targets and one catch. You have Tyler Higby getting seven targets, three catches, and 12 yards. Uh, you know, Ben Skoranek and Ronnie Rivers are the only other guys who catch a pass. They both catch one in the backfield with Cam Akers deactivated, other than Kyron Williams, you have no running back get carries. You have a few receivers because that's something that the, the Rams have done for a lot of years under McVay. But it, the whole offense was Kyron Williams, Puka Nakua, and Tutu Atwell, the three guys that had the really strong week one totals. And, I mean, Sean, the, the Nakua stuff is crazy. We I, I mentioned this to you before we started recording tonight, but I had a – a friend mentioned that he was excited to hear our thoughts on him. We didn't get a chance to really talk about him a ton on Thursday last week. I know that we mentioned him a couple of times. We did bid really big to make sure we got Nakua in multiple, in every spot that he was available, actually. I think uh, for us in our main events, he was available in four of them, if I'm not mistaken, three of the Which ones that we did together. It was really yeah. fortuitous. and It was fortuitous. And we went over $800 in every single one and over $900 every... in, in the one that we needed to the most. So we bid almost all of our blind bidding money in all of those leagues to go get him. Certainly we're very excited to see that he had 20 targets and 15 catches in week two. It's flagrantly absurd. I mean, it's flagrantly absurd. I, we mentioned last Sunday night that, you know, maybe the thing that would fix a J.K. Dobbins absence would be, you know, in 2013, it was Keenan Allen, who didn't come out and do this in the, in the first couple of weeks of the season, but ends up in the back half of the year putting up big numbers as someone who wasn't necessarily drafted and you could get off of waivers. I, I You mentioned what we bid, and that probably gives away like the whole story, but... <laughs> one of the things that I talk about pretty frequently with waivers is that, and I think we did a whole show on it at one point last year, where it's this idea that you want to more or less bid one or two or three on virtually everyone. Don't You have to fight off the temptation to put out these $15 bids or $30 bids or $50 bids on players where... I mean, yeah, you probably do want them, but the chances that you're going to bid 50 and nobody else bids and you've given away that and you can do it multiple times over the course of the season, you don't want to do that because what you do want is when you have the one guy that you think will change everything, you want to be willing to bid a couple hundred over the next closest bidder just so you don't have to worry about it, right? I mean, in some ways... 
last Wednesday night was pretty stressful because of the first waiver period, there are a decent number of players out there at certain points. We've got a lot of teams <laughs> that we're trying to manage. I had some computer problems down the stretch. And so I got much closer to the time period than I was looking to do. And you do always have that emotional element where you're like, if I bid 900 and the next closest bid is 350 and I've wasted more than half of my bidding units for the season, then I'm going to not only as an feel, overbid, <laughs> right, right. As an overbid, then not only am I going to feel silly about that, but when the bid doesn't work because anybody who wasn't drafted, when I mean, you think about how many things were the polar opposite of week one that just happened here in week two. But I strongly believe that if you think there's a guy who changes everything for you, you have to get him and you don't risk it. And so, but I don't know how close they all were. I know there were some high bids. I know that they, in the chasing stolen bananas one, you know, if we hadn't bid pretty high, we would have potentially lost him. Right. We do have him. We did start him and he scored 30 points. I don't think we massively overbid. I think maybe the biggest was like 200 to 250 of an overbid. But when you're talking about like an 800 versus a, you know, or an 850 versus a 600, you're like, okay, well, this person was willing to go to, to six, 600, 650 or something. Then I'm glad that we went to 800. You know, I mean, they, they were close. And, and anyway, all of the bids and, and you can see all the bids across all the, all the leagues. I think we were where we wanted to be, which was out in front of what the highest other bid could have reasonably have been in the leagues we wanted to. But like you said, it, it kind of tells the whole story. We really wanted to get him. We felt very confident. Um, I mean, I, one of the really interesting things about Nakua, I mean, it, it sort of underscores a number of different things, but we talked about on the show last week, Sean McVay looks reinvigorated as uh, a schemer and a play caller and a head coach in the ways that he did when he first took over with the Rams and was taking the entire league by storm. Matthew Stafford looks reinvigorated as a quarterback in the ways that he has so many times throughout his career. And he's obviously a lot leaner at this stage of his career, a lot more physically. Um, I mean, obviously he's older, so he's not like in the best shape of his life or anything, but I think looks and probably feels and is playing at a different type of stamina than maybe when he was a little bit younger. And um, in this game here, they lost because Kyron Williams batted a, relatively accurate pass into the air and it was picked at a crucial moment that's not to pile on kyron williams who had a fantastic game otherwise and looks like a true difference maker for them it was just kind of an unfortunate thing that every once in a while happens in a sporting event this was not a game that the 49ers dominated it could have easily gone either way i mean matthew Stafford no. and the rams played that well yeah no they played incredibly well so you have those elements and you have the team elements and then you have Really what, I mean, the issue is what was in the off season and it is, or at least was going into week one was, you know, who's it going to be if it's not Cooper Cup? Is this whole offense going to fall apart? People thought that this was going to implode. It's something that I know I wrote about in, in Stealing Signals in my off season, Stealing Signals, that I, my whole Ram section was about. I thought that was really overstated, that they kind of had a Super Bowl hangover in 2022, they came into the offseason having played 21 games the year prior and had a shortened offseason. We talked about this. But if it had been they the normal be... thing that people were talking about, of it being an offense that went through Van Jefferson and Tyler Higby and perhaps Cam Akers, I mean, that would be a problem. But that's where I'm going. Yeah. So you had, the, you know, <laughs> if you believe that this offense has the potential to actually be good. And then it can only be Cooper Cup. I mean, one of – yeah, I mean, I'm kind of not wanting to pile on Van Jefferson, but the the ways that Puka Nakua and Tutu Atwell are making an impact, I think underscores Van Jefferson has had a really hard time to make an impact over the last several years, that they haven't really had other playmakers other than, you know, since Robert Woods was there and and, and making a legitimate impact. Um, and now Cup gets hurt right away. But there was room here. There has to be some, and it is one of those things where, Sean, we talk a lot about the players and the skill of, of the individual players dictating what happens in the offense. But we do also talk about scheme and we do talk about quarterbacks 
And they're, we've talked a lot of the last couple of years about the haves and have nots. The Rams offense is back to being a have. And that means that it's going to bring along its players some. And so there are elements here where, yes, Puka Nakua looks like a fantastic hit, clearly. Better than, than Van Jefferson by a mile. He's even been a lot more productive and consistently productive than Tutu Atwell, who looks very good in his own right. And yet you get the blend of the player and the situation. And that's when, you know, stat lines like Kukunaku has put up in the first two games. That's when that all gels. And that's a big reason we were willing to go so big on our bids after week one as well, because we felt that we saw that in week one from the scheme and the system. In addition to what we saw from Nakua, the player, and I know I was writing you know, about having come back and looked at his profile a little more and realized that, you know, his per out run stuff was really strong. He didn't, I mean, he never really ran a ton of routes in college, even though he didn't miss a ton of time either. He just was like a rotational player for some reason. He's now a clear full-time player at the NFL level, which is just a really rare thing. I can't even think of a comp. The like profile that. is is mysterious, right? And you yeah. did a fantastic job of writing about him in your stealing signals last week. Again, anybody who for whatever reason is not subscribed, you have to get onto that. It was weird because, you know, throughout the sort of draft process, you know, I'm seeing his name at the top of some of the yards per route numbers for these guys in this class. And yet the element with the transfer with the four year, we know that doesn't, transition as well especially when the person needed the last year which i would point out that he did i mean mm-hmm. even then i mean he's barely drafted right and so it's interesting and one of the things i think is is important and it's hard is that if you were wrong on something and i would say that neither one of us obviously were drafting him and kept, given what he's done in the first couple of weeks that would clearly be wrong if there's an opportunity early on to update how you're thinking about it in a way that is more accurate and you can still play the thesis that's the new thesis the one you just described where you have the talent and you have the situation together you want to aggressively do it and you're not always given that opportunity i mean one of the things that i'm grateful for is that you know we had that opportunity and we didn't blow it by you know not being aggressive enough and you know he could defenses are going to adjust for what he's doing. He's not going to catch 15 passes of the game throughout the course of the season, just like for any other star out there. I mean, think about what Jamar Chase has done through two weeks. Yeah. You know, if, if those things can happen to Jamar Chase, I mean, Puka could sure. go through a stretch here where he has like five, you know, four catch games but what, in a row. But and I totally agree with that. But one thing I do want to emphasize while we're on this point is that I keep hearing around him and, and maybe the conversation will be different this week, but I certainly heard it last week where, He'll be good at least until Cooper Cup comes back. I think I'm willing to say very confidently that even if Cooper Cup comes back and becomes Cooper Cup in this offense again, that Puka Nakua is not going to go away. It's not like he was just holding Cooper Cup's role for him. I think very clearly like the Van Jefferson types will go away and Nakua will still be found in this offense somehow. They, they will, they'll use him in one way or another. And that might actually benefit, like you were just saying, that some of these defenses might find ways to stop him, but... When Cup comes back, then, I mean, like it actually might benefit Nakua in some respects. He's not going to have 20 target games when Cooper Cup's running routes alongside him, obviously. But, I, I mean, it, it, again, the Rams are an offense that look very exciting and also like they don't have, you know, from a quarterback and play caller's perspective, but also like they don't have players, right, that can make plays. And so they have to be super consolidated, hyper consolidated right now. One of the things with we were just talking about talent plus scheme. I'm not even convinced Kyron Williams is that great. He looks good, right? But like, you, then you go back and you look at his numbers, and he hasn't actually been super explosive in the first couple of games. But one of the things, and this, I'm so frustrated that I wasn't more on Kyron, because one of the things that I long said, but didn't think enough about this offseason, you want anyone who has a shot to be the lead back in a, in a functional Sean McVay offense. Because, I mean, you go back to remember like when C.J. Anderson just plug and played in there after he got cut from the from the Panthers or – Malcolm Brown, multi-TD games or whatever. They love to use the running back in close in the green zone. They'll throw to the back a little bit, and he likes to go really high snap shares with his running back sometimes too. So Kyron plays almost every snap in this game, catches passes, gets two touchdowns again. He has three two TDs through two games. He He's in. He's going to be an H, 
HVT, high value touch God. I love to, you know, write about that, but he's in a perfect spot where, I mean, he doesn't even necessarily have to be great. Some of these guys that are really good high value touch backs don't even have to be super talented in addition to it. I'm not saying he's bad, but I, I just, I don't even know that he's elevating what he's been handed quite a ton yet. Well, but the, the value there though is a player who can actually handle a meaningful role, a meaningful from the perspective of yes. allows the offense to run properly. And that was always the issue with Cam Akers is that he doesn't have the skill set or whatever, you know, the personality conflict that he and Sean McVay have makes it more difficult for him to handle these elements in the way that a Kyron Williams will. I mean, I'm frustrated with the Kyron Williams situation because I had a lot of him in Debbie and really liked what he was at Notre Dame. And I think that sometimes you can get, I mean, sometimes you hold on the players too long and you're continuing right. to, you know, recommend them and play them yourself or stash them yourself when you need other spot guys in other spots. And for me, the play here is Zach Evans. And so because of those two things, Williams is not somebody that I have played as a thesis for this season. And through a couple of weeks, I mean, that's, again, brutally wrong. One thing I would say here is that I hope that this stays and that Kyron Williams does this because I'm definitely not rooting against someone having success right now. The secondary part of that would be that there were some leagues where we considered adding Zach Evans kind of the last minute on Sunday. Now that would have in some ways looked silly because yes. he's inactive for this game. But even with him being inactive and with the possibility that Cam Akers comes back and actually does have a role at some point in the season too, I wouldn't think. It sounds that. like that's not going to happen. You, you spend a lot of time, I know, watching the games and, and try not to get spoilers because you watch them one at a time. There was some more reporting during the day-to-day -day that was like, it doesn't sound like Cam Akers is Done. going to be back with the team. Yeah, like either cut or traded. Like it, this, the, like I don't remember the exact wording, but it was like this Could isn't expected to resolve. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was like this isn't going to be fixed anytime soon. <laughs> I, I mean, and the so then is... there was speculation as you go into the Zach Evans, not from reporters, but from you know the the accounts on fantasy football Twitter of uh, hey maybe this is where Leonard Fournette or Kareem Hunt land if that, if Cam Akers is shipped out of town this week so that is something to, to consider uh, there might be some shakeups in that way and and you don't get the impression that someone who is inactive today is necessarily that close but Evans has the explosiveness to do the things that they need and elevate certain parts of it now he hasn't ever been he had a weird recruiting process. He wasn't a super high volume player at TCU. There is some element to where he was possibly pushed off of TCU in part because of how good Kendrick Miller is. Obviously then he goes to Ole Miss and he's fantastic on a per play basis, but again, isn't a high volume guy because of a teammate who again, in some ways overshadows him. He's a late round draft pick. He's somebody who was inactive today for Ronnie Rivers, who also is not involved in the game plan. And so when you're inactive for somebody else who doesn't play a role, that's both good and bad, right? So anyway, I would just say in this offense, when you have a guy with that much explosiveness, keep him in mind. Stash yeah. him in your really deep league. I wish we would have got be aware of you know, how this could play out in a couple of weeks. Because one of the things that we saw today and it didn't actually work out for the big Josh Kelly fans because he was more or less just completely stoned by that uh, you know, <laughs> very salty uh, Tennessee defensive line. But, I mean, one of the things that was just so brutal about week one, and we, we tend to be focused, obviously, on some of the players who were out for the entire season and certainly out for the entire season when they're on our own rosters at a heavy rate. But, I mean, how frustrating is it to get the game you got from Austin Eckler in week one and Aaron Jones in week one? and then immediately have to figure out something different for week two. So in some of these situations here where offenses are creating a lot of value to the running backs, I mean, I, we talked about it last week. I think it continues to make sense to talk about how, yes, you know, market share of EP, market share of rushing attempts, those types of things are going to be a little bit more predictive during the in season, not necessarily during, you know, across seasons, but we're thinking about where the workload is going to go. And yet these offenses that create a lot of value to the running backs 
we want to make sure that we're kind of ahead of the game and stashing some of the guys who could be the next person up. You certainly don't want to miss on the next Kyron Williams. Yeah, absolutely. And that neither of us is saying that, I mean, you don't want to miss on the next Kyron Williams, but also I don't think either of us is saying that Kyron Williams can't just be the guy for, for most of the year. Cause as you just said, very eloquently, he makes this off or allows this off option offense to function. The whole reason I went into that whole thing about like, I'm not sure that he's really elevating the role or what have you was because I, I, I do think it's sort of laughable to say that because he is producing so much and it gets back to, this is a Rams offense that just put up 386 yards today on the 49ers defense with a day three rookie. Uh, I think Tutu Atwell was a year three guy now, but a, a year three guy who has hardly played. And uh, I believe also a day three second year player, Kyron Williams, or day two second. Was he a third round pick? I can't remember. Regardless, pretty unheralded players that have done almost nothing over the last couple of years. No one really expected a ton out of them. They've all been good in their own right. And I want to emphasize that something we talked about with a guy like Tyler Higby is he had over hundred targets last year. I kept bringing that setup in the off season, but I would also say, and I wrote about this. I don't think they wanted Tyler Higby to have hundred targets. That's a part of their offense. When they go and analyze over the off season, they say, we don't want to have to throw these underneath looks at these very inefficient hundred targets. Tyler Higby, we need to get, other plays to replace those hundred plays. And you see that immediately. We find things with Puka Nakua and Tutu Atwell and Kyron Williams as a functional, you know, set of, of skill players that are, are, are working for our offense. Ben Squaronic last year was getting a bunch of touches in this game. He has one target, one catch and one carry. Um, so two touches on offense. You're not seeing, and even, I mean, Van Jefferson, again, he's running a lot of routes, but even he only ends up with four targets. He has the one catch, but you're not even seeing him get targeted. It's like we are going to run plays and design things for the players that make the offense function. Kyron Williams, that's not a minor compliment to say that he's good enough or his skill set is such that it allows the offense to function in the ways that it, that it needs to function. And then he's elevated from a fantasy scoring perspective by the fact that when this offense functions, when a Sean McVay offense functions, the running back scores. That's just the bottom. It doesn't matter who it is. When I mentioned the C.J. Anderson thing, it's because it's so funny that he went to the Panthers and people were drafting him in its late single-digit rounds thinking he was going to stop Christian McCaffrey from playing. And he was so bad and, and really out of shape that he got cut. And if I'm not mistaken, he went to a different team and then got cut again and then landed on the Rams that year, and then winds up going for like 150 yards and multiple touchdowns like four weeks in a row. It wasn't all in the fantasy season. It was like the, the league championship week, and then into the uh, wild card round and the divisional round, he was crushing, absolutely crushing off the street, and then did nothing again after that at that point in his career because he was pretty much you know kind of done. He was uh, not really adding a lot to the role either, but – that's, I mean, this offense is very positive for the things that we look at for running back scoring in terms of the potential for a heavy snap share, the potential for high value touches, all of those types of things. So working really well for Kyron. And again, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to dog Kyron at all, but it's so clear that this is an offense you want pieces of. I couldn't agree with you more, Sean, that if you can be stashing Zach Evans or if they bring anyone in or whoever might have a shot to be a functional piece of this offense, we we need to be excited about that. If Cut can get back and get healthy, you got to be really optimistic about him. I think he's a buy low. There's talk that he could be back in time for week five. I think this Rams team is is trying to win. I mean, I don't think they're, like you said, they could have won this game against a really good 49ers team that, by the way, in their own right, had 365 total yards today, averaged 6.8 yards per play. They were very good. The Rams defense may be something of an issue, but there is something to be said about the fact that in a game where the Niners offense was functional and flowing and scoring points, the Rams were right there with them and, and probably could have won this game, as you said, if not for losing the turnover battle two to zero. So a very exciting game there and another huge data point that the Rams are kind of back. Well, and I, I did want to mention on the 49ers side, as well you went through how good Debo Samuel looked and he looked fantastic the touchdown run was peak 2021 and you know they're 
are going to be some games where because of Christian McCaffrey and Brandon Ayuk that he doesn't have huge numbers. But I still, I mean, one of the things that I like the most after week two, where I feel the most comfortable about in terms of our plan for the season, the emphasis on Keenan Allen and Debo Samuel at the three, four turn, I think there's at least a strong likelihood that that's going to work out well in part because those guys are just so good. And right. the players who are drafted in that range more on volume, I just, it's very difficult to compete with that because you don't have the talent level to fall back on. And one of the things that I would mention, and we got you know sort of fortunate on our, the Chasing Stolen Bananas team to be able to, right before the season, flip out some guys and stash Purdy as well as a backup to Tua, which I think could be something that comes into play a time or two during the season. I mean, hopefully you have a full clean season from Tagovailoa there. But in this particular game here, he ends up only throwing 25 times. He averages over eight yards per attempt, but he also gets a short yardage rushing touchdown, which you know may or may not give you a little bit of a sense of how they'll play balls from the half yard line. I mean, if you end up with four or five of those in the season, it makes a difference. But also, and you can look at this as either a good or a bad sign, but he doesn't get the touchdown passes in this game. And yet, Brandon Ayuk, who, as you mentioned, did get hurt and did miss a pretty decent chunk of time. I'll be interested to see when I get a chance to really digest the full you know, route numbers and whatnot, just how much of this game he actually missed. He goes to the tent. He wasn't that involved or someone who appeared to be the read hardly ever after he got dinged up early. I mean, he continued to play through the right. game. But he had the one did... play not long after the ding where he had to kind of go down to the ground and he very gingerly got up. Debo had his arm around him and was kind of like helping him back to the huddle. It, he j- didn't look right. Yeah, he was he was definitely banged up in this, but he did get open down the field later for yep. what would have been a big chunk play and Purdy missed him. Debo got behind the defense for what would have been a long touchdown and Purdy missed him. And Purdy made a beautiful throw to Debo in the back of the end zone where pass interference was called. And so then you get the ball down at the one, you don't get the touchdown pass. There were opportunities with Samuel and Ayuk getting behind this Rams defense, even beyond the efficient day that Purdy had. So, I mean, you're kind of hoping he makes those throws in the future. So it's, again, a good news, bad news deal where there are more opportunities there. Purdy looked very good other than those misses. You hope he can execute on those plays because those are the plays that give you the really big fantasy games. Completely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you said that perfectly. I thought he looked good other than that. Sean, before we wrap up, we are getting kind of late, but one thing I really want to talk to you about going back to Thursday, because mostly we sit here and we talk on Sunday nights, all the stuff that um, we just saw and we're excited to chat about, but I, I, before I let you go, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Eagles rushing attack. Obviously Deandre Swift was your number one, um zero rb target and the zero rb countdown this year got a lot of us pretty excited i know i drafted some more deandre swift from that point through week one and then in week one we get this kenneth gainwell workhorse role that was a bummer especially if we st- you know the couple of leagues sean where we started deandre swift You're like Week one, how do I unsubscribe? How do I unfollow? Like, Sean's not going to notice that you unfollowed him. No, he's not there. The opposite. The opposite was how is Sean going to do some more voodoo and make this somehow work out for DeAndre Swift? And and I don't know how you got Kenneth Gainwell injured, but he, no, I'm just kidding. But he did. Um, he did end up missing on the short week, and then Swift in in, in game two. And I thought we were going to get more Penny in week two. I was excited to see more of Penny. I do think if you're in any kind of casual league that's reasonable shallowness, that Penny is a pretty clear cut. Sean, you may not agree, but my my take on this is the positive spin from week one would have had to have been that Boston Scott was only active for special teams. But then in week two, Boston Scott is playing as the clear number two ahead of Rashad Penny until he gets a concussion and is knocked out of the game. And only then does Penny come into the game. And then even at that point, Penny ends up having a pretty bad hold in a pass protection situation where uh, AJ Brown has a, a receiving touchdown called back because uh, Penny grabbed the blitzer and gets called for it, gets flagged. And so he only ends up with four touches. He only ends up with touches in the second half after Boston Scott is playing on offense ahead of him. And so it's not the case that, you know, Scott was just active before special teams. It seems more like the case that they have Rashad Penny fourth on their depth chart and, and you should probably just cut him in fantasy football. 
The flip side of that, though, Sean, is the part that I want to talk to you about. DeAndre Swift, and you and I kind of went back and forth on this, some, some about you know whether it was worth the cost to get up to Swift in the sixth round. I liked to take the penny pick in the 10th, 11th, 12th, where the um, opportunity costs a little bit lower, especially at the receiver position, still reasonably high. But he is, a, I think, an easier cut. You don't love cutting him at this point, but an easier cut than if you would have been taking him in the sixth round or taking a play in the sixth round. Certainly, though, the sixth round running back in this backfield, DeAndre Swift, isn't going to be cut anytime soon. He goes for 28 carries in this game, which was a real shock. I mean, I that was a surprise to me as it was unfolding. I was like, man, this guy's getting up there. And 175 rushing yards, you just don't see rushing games like this that often anymore in the NFL. They only throw 23 times. Their entire game plan was give the ball to DeAndre Swift. They talked a little bit in the week following week one. Uh, Nick Sirianni had a comment, look, we don't want to only get DeAndre Swift two touches in a game. He backed that up. He gets him 31 total touches, three catches as well. But the 175 rushes and how good he looked in the rushing TD, uh, what do you think happens now when Gainwell is presumably okay on the you know little mini buy they get after the Thursday night football? They have a 10-game stretch. I'm assuming the penny goes back to being inactive unless Boston Scott's not able to get cleared from the concussion. But what do you think happens? It it does seem very likely that that Swift and Gainwell are the top two backs. Do you think Swift did enough here in week two that they have to make him the lead? Do you think there's a possibility that Gainwell's back in the lead? Does that even matter? Or are we just now pretty sure that as the season rolls on, things are going to just shift more towards DeAndre Swift? I think it'll be a mix and having him at number one. And again, the countdown kind of works, you know, in reverse order of ATP, but that was predicated on the idea that it would be a mix and the gain will would be involved. And I tried to write it up from a perspective or at least letting people know that, Gainwell was definitely someone, the number one I liked in the past, he was on the previous year's zero RB countdown and does bring some meaningfully useful elements. I think in a similar way, really, to Kyron Williams. You could argue that he does some of those types of things for the Eagles offense. And then you have this first game that is early and has some weather and you really want to win that first game. And so part of me is thinking, I mean, you've, you've had all off season to prepare. It, if a guy isn't ready to play, who is not a rookie in week one, then I, I mean, that's a little bit of a red flag for me. He should be able to get out there and play in this game some, but if you are more or less controlling a game, you have some bad weather, you feel like Gainwell is the safe play and you want to win that first game. I can understand the other thing that it really does illustrate is that, Every game is a little bit different in terms of how much of a mix there is. One of the things I thought was a little bit surprising last year was that Miles Sanders played extremely well in stretches. And even in the stretches where he was playing well and was healthy, they would remove him at relatively key junctures for fantasy managers and use Boston Scott or use Kenny Gainwell. And so you know that using multiple guys is something that they're willing to do for them to come out in week one and really not use DeAndre Swift, I think was pretty surprising in that light. And yet again, it it just underlines how a game can kind of get away from coaches. And so sometimes after a game where they say, you know, look, you know, we had more in for him and we didn't end up calling those plays and we have to in the future. You're like, okay, well, I know you guys spend like 24 hours a day, (laughs) seven days a week getting ready for these games. You know, if you really wanted to do that, I feel like you would have called the plays. Not necessarily the case. An NFL football game goes by extremely quickly. Every time that we have a sort of Nathaniel Hackett situation and you get really frustrated by a team that is poorly coached and the plays don't make sense and the scheme doesn't create any advantages and the play caller can't even get the play in on time which is what the Broncos were dealing with last year. I mean, you're kind of thinking to yourself, just as a, a casual fan who you know is not immersed in all this, you're like, that's actually more what I would expect because it just seems like there are a lot of moving parts for these guys to be executing everything properly. And so 
and, and you hear all the time that, oh, this guy is in because he's actually going to do the right thing. And this guy is out for the opposite reasons. Basically, that's a long-winded way of saying, I think it, it, there are ways in which it makes sense for Gainwell to be involved in week one. And I certainly think he's going to be involved at times in the future because there's no way that the Philadelphia Eagles want someone like DeAndre Swift, who has a history of shoulder problems, a history of ankle problems. I mean, he's not going to, they don't want him to carry more than 20 times, much less 28. The thing that's really good news here is that they're in all likelihood in at least a lot of games, not every game, but there's going to be enough rushing volume for the Eagles, for Kenny Gainwell to actually take a pretty decent chunk of work and for DeAndre Swift to still have more than he can handle from a full season basis. And the thing that we saw in this game is the thing that we've always seen from DeAndre Swift, which is that Arguably, no back in football is better before contact than Swift is. And the I was reason thinking, you said that all offseason, I was thinking about that watching him. That that point you made, and I repeated it and, and cited you, but the, that was the point that you drove home. And that Miles Sanders succeeded that way in this offense last year. They're going to open up the holes for him, and Swift is so good before contact. That site, that stat still gets cited as in defense of unexplosive backs getting hit in the backfield a lot. And I love that you you reference it in the sense that the running back, I mean, the blocking obviously plays into it as well, but the running back plays into it too. And and that's the point you've made so many times with DeAndre Swift. And I just, I was thinking about it the whole time watching that game that he was doing a lot before contact. He was, he was explosive and hitting holes and, and the vision and the ability to get to the second level without being touched even is so apparent when you watch him run. And it's great for him. I mean, it's, that was the reason for the thesis of you got to have at least some exposure to him, especially at prices that I think are pretty good. Now, one of the things that I would say is that I wrote an article about him on you know Friday night, Saturday morning, what have you, and talked about where he went in relationship to some other backs who just don't have very much talent and were more volume plays. And I would mention that a lot of those guys actually hit in week two. And so I'm sure that there are some listeners who are like, yeah, but I mean, these other guys also look like they're going to actually be useful fantasy players. And, you know, we do want to keep that in context that they, some of those players, maybe like a, a James Conner or a Rashad White, I mean, still obviously very high on Sean Tucker, but they may have a little bit easier paths to really having the volume that in some individual games like week two does result in pretty decent fantasy scoring. But when you look at DeAndre Swift and what he can do there just aren't that many backs like that and that's sort of what we're chasing especially in elite offenses and that's kind of the contrast between the Eagles and certainly now what you know a player like Brees Hall it was <laughs> the Monday night game was so amazing for him that you just want to celebrate it and not get into this element of okay well Zach Wilson also destroys Brees Hall in addition to <laughs> destroying Garrett Wilson but when you have a back like a DeAndre Swift in the Philadelphia Eagles offense it's so perfect because the thing that DeAndre Swift is not going to give you in quite the same way as say a David Montgomery who looked very good for the Lions today I gave him a hard time from his week one he looked great today until he got hurt uh not going to give you quite like say a David Montgomery they're not going to give you in the same way as you know some of these backs who are 220 and hit the line really hard i mean if he's contacted by multiple guys at the line of scrimmage that's not ideal for his running style the flip side of that though is that not only is the vision and the explosiveness and one of the things that shows up in that game on thursday night which we have to give the offensive line credit for is they were opening gaping holes right gaping holes and so i think that in those cases it's easy to be like well anybody could have run through them and there were a couple of plays where boston scott ran through them extremely well also but you want someone like a DeAndre Swift, especially if he's going to get 20, 25, 28 carries, who does it consistently. And then when they get to the second level, they have the second level explosiveness also. Because even though Swift is not great when he's got a lot of bodies on him at the line of scrimmage, he is very good with the individual defenders in the secondary. The ability to take an arm tackle, glance off it, keep going, to just make the guy miss entirely. If you are the Eagles and you're going to get backs onto the second level, you want someone with Swift's background where he can take it the whole way. And we tend to think of like all of these plays that added up to the 175 yards, but the 43 yard run was a huge one in the game. 
And I don't know that the other backs on the Eagles give that run to you. We talk all the time about what are the teams that are the best offenses right now looking for? They're looking for backs who will give you that run. That's exactly right. And I think you made a great point too, that like they were opening up fantastic holes, but there's still, I mean, you wind up with, I wouldn't have guessed he could go 28 carries <laughs> or that he would in this game. The fact that you average 6.3 yards per carry, which in large part is because of the big runs, because of the 43-yard run, et cetera, but you average over six yards per carry on a 28-carry sample, right? I mean, that's how you get to 175 yards, et cetera. I mean, I'm just doing some math. But it is, I think, so there's something to be said as you talk through that there's going to be a little bit of a split here going forward and some of those things. It's a very positive sign that when they needed to lean on him for almost 30 carries, he continued to be efficient well into that. There was no like wear down. There was no, oh, I can't handle that. I think there are people that passes too, which is great. Right. I think there are people that think of Swift as obviously because of some of the injuries and et cetera, but think of him as not being a workhorse or being able to handle this. He's not a small back. I mean, for a receiving back, he is over. 200 what is he like 210 215 right i mean he has size yeah Yeah. and i mean i don't think he was ever really a big workhorse in college but he is a guy he showed in this game that that can handle a decent amount of touches even though that was never his role in detroit but he's not your prototypical i mean like when i talk about kyron for example kyron's more like a 195 pound back and for people who just hear those numbers and they go in one ear and out the other we're looking for 210 and above when we start to get to 220 and above or 230, you're talking about really big backs. And then the the range of what the 40 times need to be is actually a little bit a little bit smaller, a little slower. They don't have to be, you know, incredibly fast. You'd still like them to be athletic, but those are the really big backs, 220 plus, 230 plus, right? 210 is what you're hoping for for adequate size. Between 200 and 210 is where people start saying that's not usually workhorse size. I mean, that's where McCaffrey sits and, and Aaron Jones sits. And there are some guys that have sat in that range. Sub 200 is when you start to get to, oh, he's a specialist back and he's not going to be an every down guy. Kyron is 194, I think was his listed weight at the combine and uh, was playing 95% of the snaps today or something like that. So we'll see how that all holds up for him. He looks like a guy at 194 that can that can handle it. I mean, I, I would say that. Like you were talking about, well, he was you a saw big, really good stuff. Notre Dame. Yeah. Yeah, at Notre Dame. You saw that stuff in Notre Dame. You can see that. He seems like that type of a back. You know, I could totally see him having – like a Miles Gaskin type year this year. I mean, that's what it feels like to me a little bit. Um, Miles Gaskin, I think, also a little bit undersized, but was able to play that type of role for a Miami team for a whole season and be a really big fantasy force. So, well, the th- other thing be- with Swift too. I mean, all of our listeners saw this game and know this, but I mean, tackled at the six inch line twice, right? I mean, this is a game where you could have two, three touchdowns, and I'm not saying that's going to happen very often. But when you're trying to figure out how you get the total number of touchdowns up and how you have guys on your roster where you can win your semifinals and finals, or if you're playing in tournaments, how you can win a tournament. I mean, you need guys who have more than just like a really, really deep shot at a multi-touchdown game. Definitely. Yep, I think that's very well said. I don't know why I was getting back into Kyron Williams, Sean. We're over an hour. I'm getting tired. It's late Sunday. <laughs> this has been a blast, though. I, I mean, this is fun. I love talking to you on Sundays after the games. This was uh, an exciting week. We could probably go for three more hours talking through. There's just so much to talk about. I'm, I'm. You got me super fired up to write stealing signals this week. I'll, I'll say that. <clears throat> well, I'm excited too. Give that a read. Also, there was a one-off post this week that had some really cool stuff in it, and I'm not going to spoil it, but there was you know, some conjecture in there that I hadn't really thought through. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's what Ben is bringing to the table that most people aren't. So this has been Stealing Bananas. I am Sean Siegel. With me is Ben Gretsch. We loved week two. We hope you loved it. I want to make sure you are following Ben at Yards Per Gretch. Make sure you are signed up for Stealing Signals. Again, week one, the writing there, so beautiful. And just how it helps you understand what happened in those games. 
the best resource there is out there. We'd also love you guys to join us over at Rotoviz. Then I think we may have had our largest number of in season articles for a week ever last week. And the number is you guys are turning out a ton of new writers too, turning out some great stuff. They're doing a great job. And then I mean, Curtis with his dynasty piece, Blair. I mean, we've got some pretty cool stats, which everybody has stats. We, we know that. But the tools that Dave Cabin has put together using the sports info solutions data, I mean, they, they really are pretty cool. And the work that he did with the wide receiver cornerback matchup article that Blair did just sort of globally, I love those. You know, make sure you... It, certainly, if you're a subscriber, you know, check those out. If you're not, you can get 10% off using the coupon code RV Radio 2023 at checkout. As you listen to this, if you have a game in the balance for Monday night, good luck with those. We're rooting for you. We'll talk to you soon.